In this video, we're going to go through the entire process of building a sinew and snakeskin backed Osage longbow. We're going to start at the very beginning and go harvest some bow wood, or in this case, a lot of bow wood. Then, towards the end of the video, we're going to take this bow out elk hunting and see just how effective a primitive bow can be. Although this isn't intended to be a tutorial on how to build a bow, you're bound to learn something if you watch it all the way through. If you're looking for detailed instructions on how to build high performance wood bows, you can find that in my book, on my Master Bow Your DVDs, both of which are available on my website, or by signing up at my Patreon site. I'll provide links to all of those in the description below. Once the staves are split, they need to be stored in a dry place until the internal moisture content is around 10% or less. How long that takes depends on the drying conditions and the dimensions of the stave. It takes a while. Once the stave is dry, we use a draw knife to expose one annual unbroken growth ring along its entire back. The back of the bow is the part that faces away from you when you shoot it. This will ensure a strong back capable of withstanding the stresses of being a bow. A compass and a sharpie comes in very handy for drawing the profile on the back of the bow. Osage is well known for its snaky grain, and to build the best bow that we can build, it's important to follow that grain, which oftentimes results in a bow with a lot of character. After you've been building bows for a while, you come up with little techniques to help save time. Sawing these slots and popping off big hunks of belly wood is a huge time saver. Now it's on to thinning out the limbs enough so that they'll start to bend just a little bit. A rasp is helpful for getting right down to your lines and resulting in a limb that has a nice even taper. Once the limbs are thinned out enough, you should be able to put the knock on the ground and with a little bit of pressure see some bend. This is called floor tillering. 
At this stage, it's sometimes necessary, depending on the stave, to heat the wood and bend things into alignment. A heat gun comes in really handy for this. Now it's on to reflexing the tips. Now this stage is optional, but I prefer to reflex or recurve the tips on all my bows. It makes for a smoother draw and can increase the performance of the bows. And now it's time to get into the real art of bow making, and that's tillering. Tillering refers to getting the limbs to bend on a nice arc and then also evenly from side to side. The process takes repetition. You scrape a little bit, you put it up on the tillering rack to see how the limbs are bending, and then you scrape a little bit more, correcting any kind of issues that you found when the bow was on the tillering rack. And you keep doing this over and over again until you get all the way down to your draw length and ideally hit the weight that you're after at the same time. I get a lot of questions around tillering and one of those questions is how heavy can you make these bows? And the answer to that question is how heavy do you want it? You can make these bows as heavy or as light as you want just simply by the amount of wood you remove from the belly. Once we're part way through the tillering process, I go ahead and cut the knocks in so that we can brace the bow with a short string. Another question that I often get is how thick should my limbs be for a given draw weight? Now that is a very difficult question to answer and really it's impossible to answer because it depends on a lot of factors. How long the bow is, how wide the bow is, what kind of wood, and a lot of other things. And so it doesn't really matter how thick your limbs are, you arrive at your desired draw weight simply by removing wood and it ends up wherever it ends up. Most of my bows end up around 14 or 15 millimeters thick. Now from this point until the bow is finished, the tillering process goes very quickly and it is very easy to mess up because taking away just a little bit of wood can make a big difference in how the bow bends. Take a little bit off, check it out. Take a little bit more off, check it out. Back and forth, back and forth. Now at this point, this bow is pretty much done and it's technically a self bow right now, meaning an unbacked bow, but I'm gonna go ahead and put a sinew backing on this one. This sinew came from the back strap of an elk. When I have the opportunity, I prefer to work with back sinew versus leg sinew uh, because it's a lot easier and the bundles are so long that they'll go from the handle section all the way to the tip without having to overlap them.
Once the hide glue is gelled, you can go ahead and wrap it with an ace bandage or strips of cloth, and that's going to result in a much smoother finish when the sinew is cured. The sinew needs to be completely cured before you start working on the bow again, and this could take anywhere from a couple weeks to a couple of months depending on, again, the drying conditions and how thick the sinew is. Once the sinew is all cured out, you can use heavy grit sandpaper to make any kind of tiller adjustments that you might need. Sinew tends to attract moisture, and so it's advisable to cover it with something. In this case, we're using copperhead skins, which not only help to protect the sinew, but are very attractive on the back of this bow. Now that the bow's done, we're going to start on some arrows. Here we're splitting wild turkey feathers for fletchings. I prefer wild turkey when I can get them because they stand up much better than domestic feathers and they look really good as well. I use a bench top belt sander to make all my wild turkey fletchings and I've got an older video if you search the site uh, that shows you exactly how to do this. Here's a bit of marital advice. If you guys are going to get into primitive archery or traditional archery, you definitely need to find an understanding wife that's going to let you dip arrows in the living room. Thank you. 
This bow shoots absolutely amazing, and these couple of clips that you're watching here were actually shot from before I put the snake skin on it. And when the aspen leaves start to change, it's time to hit the mountains. Elk hunting is one of my passions, and carrying a bow and arrows that I've made myself in the mountains in pursuit of these animals just feels right. For me, the limitations inherent in these bows just fuels my desire to be out there and to overcome those challenges. I can't tell you how many times I've had animals so close yet just out of range, but that just gives me the opportunity to learn, which makes me a better hunter and able to apply those lessons to next time. If you decide to take on the challenge of hunting with a handmade longbow or recurve, you're definitely going to give up some opportunities to put meat in the freezer. But when you do find that intersection between man, animal, and arrow on the side of that mountain, there is nothing quite like it.
I got it. I got it. Providing for your family with simple tools that you've made for yourself is one of the most gratifying things you can imagine. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. If you did, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and share it with your friends. Big thanks to everybody that signed up over on Patreon that helps us support these things. We'll see you guys next time. Walk on down that straight on down there. Get in the bottom. That that way. See that little trail? Back that way? Yeah, just you're gonna get in the bottom. <laughs>